Well, with that, let's turn our Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 18 this morning. Title of our study is How to Overcome Temptation. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, How to Overcome Temptation. Last week we, last week we learned how to handle trials, and today we're going to learn how to overcome temptations. As I was preparing and I was looking at this, I was wondering, why did James connect the two? Testings and trials and temptations. As I was looking at that, I, I realized that it's simply this. If we're not careful, the testings that are on the outside, if we don't deal with them correctly, will lead to temptations on the inside. If there are things that come our way and we're stressed about it or we don't know how to handle the situation, there could be a temptation that leads us in a direction we don't want to go. Uh, thankfully, though, God has given us warning signs to help us avoid the directions that we're not supposed to go. And those warning signs can save your life. Uh, unfortunately, there have been many crashes, both from uh, vehicle drivers and uh, airplane pilots, uh, that could have been avoided. They could have heeded their uh, procedural list, or they could have heeded their warning signals. Uh, that there was a warning going off, the alarm, and, and they chose to ignore it. Uh, and so we want to make sure we heed those uh, warnings, uh, those warning lights. And I think the same can be true said about all of us. If we ignore the warning signs that danger is ahead, or uh, if we head this direction, or we need to stop and address the situation before we continue, uh, if we don't do that, things could go wrong. You know, if you get in a vehicle and the the check engine light is on and the out of gas light is on and the low oil gas light comes on and uh, there's no heat in the car and you think, you know, this is going to work. And then you get in the car and it says low pressure in your tires and you go, well, I'm just going to ignore all of that. My car is going to be fine. You're going you're gonna to have some consequences. And, and that's what we see what James is going to talk about here as we take a look at this, this section is that there are God-given warning signs to us that we want to heed and that we want to consider and there are three facts here that we want to consider, three warning signs, if you will, if we're to overcome temptation. If you're a note taker, I want to encourage you to jot these down. Uh, the first one is in verse 12. We want to consider God's blessings. We'll consider his blessing for us. Uh, the second is in verses 13 through 16. We want to consider God's judgment. And really we'll look at that as the consequences of sin, which is God's judgment uh, for that. And then lastly, we'll consider God's goodness in verses 17 through 18. So with that, let's take a look at verse 12 and consider God's blessing. James chapter 1, picking up in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. As I was reading this verse, I noticed it didn't say, Blessed is the man who is never tempted. Nor does it say, Blessed is the man who finds all temptation easy to conquer. Instead, the promise is given to those who endure temptation, who go through it, who come out a victory, uh, not a victim. And there's a special blessing from God for the one who can say no to temptation uh, and, and really saying yes to God to begin with. Uh, there's, a, there's always a special blessing if we can just say, you know, I'm not going to have that direction. I'm going to just submit to the Lord and follow Him. Uh, we're not going to have to reap those consequences. And temptation is um, uh, one of the things that happens in our life. And here James is stating the purpose of God in allowing temptation is to approve us. It's, it's that through the testing, we're going to be revealed as genuine and strong in our faith. Again, we looked at this last week, that a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. And if you're going to go through a temptation, and, and your faith doesn't kick in, you'll find out pretty quick is, was that faith genuine? Was I trusting in the Lord at that moment, or was I trusting in myself? Now, the good news is that there's always forgiveness in Christ Jesus, that we can come to Him, and we can seek that forgiveness and that we can move forward. Um, but it's one of those things that we need to seek 
and persevere through. Seek the Lord and persevere through. And one of the many rewards is the crown of life which the Lord has promised. This reminds us that our steadfastness to reject the pull of the world, the pull of our flesh, and the pull of Satan, and to pursue Jesus Christ is rewarded. That we'll get this crown of life. Uh, There are a few sections in Scripture where God tells us we're going to get crowns. Uh, You get to the end of Revelation, it says that we're going to cast our crowns at His feet. I mean, the truth is, He deserves all the glory and the majesty. But it's it's a way that God blesses us through that perseverance, by demonstrating our love for Jesus, by resisting temptation. And, and that's because the passions of sinful temptation can be only overcome by a greater passion for Jesus Christ. That's a passion for honor and a passion for glory in our relationship for God. If we're obsessed and consumed with something other than Jesus, it's going to pull us in that direction. If we're obsessed and consumed by Jesus, we're going to be heading in that direction, closer to the Lord. So, we want to make sure we we resist that temptation. Now, it's also interesting here as we look at this, that some people resist temptation not because of of the, really, the fear of God that they would break his heart because they love him, but really because of the fear of man. They're afraid of getting in trouble. For example, the thief, as soon as he sees the policeman, will have a fear that he doesn't want to get caught, and so he'll avoid uh, fully committing that crime. Uh, The man or the woman who controls their uh, lusts because they couldn't bear to be found out or embarrassed if they went through with that action, uh, that's because of a fear of consequences of man. Um, If nobody knew about it, they would go forward in that direction. But really, again, the best motive for resisting temptation is to love God. Uh, Love Him with a greater power and a greater passion than your love for sin. Uh, And and that's that's the simple truth, is if we love the Lord, it will be a greater desire than the things that are going to pull us away from Him. So, you and I are blessed as we overcome temptation, as we endure, as we follow Jesus Christ. And that's God's blessing for us. So that's the first thing that we want to, uh, to note. And if you're a note taker, I want to encourage you to jot that down, to consider God's blessing. The next thing we need to consider is God's judgment. And we see that in verses 13 through 16. And James goes on to write, Let no one say when he is tempted... I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren." The first thing we need to keep in mind about temptation is that God does not tempt anyone. If there's a temptation that comes our way, it's not because God is trying to tempt us. God doesn't tempt us with sin. We have a threefold enemy. We have Satan, the world, and our flesh. And so those are things that are going to try and drag us away from the Lord. The second thing we need to know is that temptations are not sinful. We see that Jesus was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. Right? The devil tried to tempt him in the wilderness for 40 days, that he never sinned. So the temptation is not sinful. It's acting upon it, or entertaining the thought about it, or uh, having that desire to head that direction that becomes sinful. It's like having a, two magnets, right? and one of the magnets is that sin, and, and the pole is the temptation. And if we have the magnet inside of us that's desiring it, we're going to be attracted to that. Jesus never had that attraction to sin. He never had the desire to head in that, that way to, uh, to commit any kind of sins. So we want to make sure that we know that um, temptations will come, um, but we want to overcome. So how does temptation become sinful? Well, verse 14 tells us that each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. 
there are four things I want us to consider as we take a look at the, uh, as we consider God's judgment. And again, if you're a note taker, I want to encourage you to jot these four things down. The first is desire. The second is deception. The third is disobedience. And the fourth is death. And we'll take a look at each of these four stages uh, as we progress in this section. The first in verse 14 is desire. Now again, desires are not inherently evil. God has given us desires to eat and to sleep and to love, and those things are good. But if we try and satisfy those desires outside of God's will, outside of His purpose, then it becomes sinful. And then really we get into trouble, all kinds of trouble. For example, eating is normal. Overeating, having the desire to eat everything, is called gluttony, which is sinful. Sleeping is normal, but having the desire to sleep all the time and never do anything is called laziness. Uh, And that's not good. Uh, Laziness is sin. Hebrews 13.4 tells us that marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So God has designed that there would be this love attraction within the bounds of marriage, which is good. Outside of that, not so good. So again, those God-given desires can be used in a way that pleases Him, and anything outside of His will is going to get us into trouble. Now again, temptations will come our way. Uh, I think it was the reformer Martin Luther who said that... um, he, he correlated temptations with, with a bird. He said, you know, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head. Meaning you can't stop thoughts from popping in your mind or uh, the, the things that are in this world that are going to try and trap you and, 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 you know, knock you down through temptation. But those birds will fly over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest on your head. Meaning you don't have to entertain the thoughts. You don't have to welcome the idea and, and, and contemplate, how do I make this happen? How do I dwell on this? How do I move forward in this direction? So we can't stop those things. And I can tell you, there have been times in my life where something's popped in my mind and go, whoa, where did that come from? That wasn't from the Lord. And if that was for me, Lord, forgive me. If that's from the enemy, Lord, rebuke him. Uh, that's not godly, right? And so things are going to come into our mind. Things will come that... You know, we uh, could be something hateful, could be something lustful, uh, could be something prideful. And, and we want to make sure we deal with those in an appropriate way. But temptations will come. It's how we deal with it that makes the difference. Again, we don't want to let our mind be overtaken by it. We don't want to dwell on it or entertain those thoughts. There's a real battleground for our, our minds and for our hearts. And the devil knows this. He knows that we have victory in Christ Jesus, and that if he can't beat us, he'll try and wear us down. If you've ever watched boxing, you've seen this before, is that sometimes, uh, very rarely, they can knock him down on the first punch. But over time, as they keep going at it, they wear him out. They wear him down. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to wear us down, where finally we just are tired, and we give in. And so we need to keep that endurance. We must keep our minds on Jesus Christ and the blood that He shed on the cross for us. These desires must be our servants and not our masters. And this we can do through Christ Jesus. As we submit to Him, as we resist the devil, the devil will flee from us. We'll have victory as we overcome these temptations. So the first thing we see here is desire. The second thing we see here in verse 14 is deception. Uh, And that word drawn away carries with it the idea of deception. And and it's interesting here, the word enticed in the original Greek language means to bait a hook. As I thought about that, what came to my mind was hunting and fishing. If you're going to be hunting an animal, typically you've got something there that's set up as bait, and you've got a trap, right, to catch them. If you're a fisherman... Uh, You use a fishing hook with bait. Could be a live minnow, could be a worm, could be a rubber worm, could be uh, something plastic out there. But you're using something to try and attract the fish, right? And that's that's what this imagery is here: is that there is something to attract the prey. 
And if you think about it, no animals are going to deliberately step into a trap if they know they're going to be killed. No fish is going to deliberately bite a hook if it knows that it's going to be its last bite. Um, and so that's the idea, is to hide the trap, to hide the hook, to, to use the bait as something that's appealing with them not knowing there's a hook behind it, something that's going to take you in. And temptation works the exact, the, the exact same way. It always carries with it some sort of bait that appeals to our, our natural desires. The bait's the exciting thing. Um, and it not only attracts us, but it hides the fact that yielding to that desire is going to end in consequences um, that's going to bring sorrow and punishment, guilt and shame, embarrassment, and ultimately, if we're not careful, sin. So the bait keeps us from seeing the consequences of sin. The good news is when you know the Bible, you can detect that that is not going to work. That there is a hook behind that bait. That that is false. That we're not to head in that direction. It's not something good. And I, I've seen this in my own life. It's, it's that time you have that gut feeling, usually, that you shouldn't be heading that direction. or There's just something not right about that. Uh, I also believe it's our God-given conscience that God will sound the alarm saying, nope, nope, don't go in that direction. You know, don't go there. That's not good. Um, God has given that to us to keep us safe. So, again, there's going to be deception. We want to make sure we overcome that by knowing the Word of God, by detecting that bait and dealing with it decisively. We want to make sure that we're not being drawn away by those temptations, by those desires. So we've looked at desire, we've looked at deception. The next one we see here in verse 15 is disobedience. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown brings forth death. We've moved from the emotions, desire, and the intellect, deception, to the will. James kind of changes the picture from hunting and fishing here to that of childbirth. To that of giving birth to a, a baby. And so desire conceives a method for taking the bait. The will approves the acts and the result is disobedience, sin. Whether we feel it or not, we're hooked and trapped. The baby is born and just wait till it matures. It's not going to end well. It reminds me that Christian living is a matter of the will, not the feelings. I've got kids, and I can tell you oftentimes they do things because of feelings. And our world tells us today, if it feels good, do it. Right? If you follow that logic, well, I'm not going to eat broccoli because it doesn't taste good. I'm not going to brush my teeth because I don't like it. I don't like the feeling of toothpaste. I'm not going to make my bed because I have to do it every day. Uh, that's not a good way to live your life. We want to live our life by will, by knowing that there are things we're supposed to be doing versus things that we just feel like we want to do and things we feel like we don't want to do. So children operate on the basis of feeling. Adults operate on the basis of will, making those choices. And they make that act because it's right no matter how you feel. I think this explains why immature Christians usually fall into temptations. Because they're basing their experience, their Christian life, off uh, feelings rather than walking by faith. Rather than by trusting in the Lord. And so, don't let your feelings make the decisions in your life. Let the truth of God's work make the decisions in your life. Because those feelings will lead you astray. But faith in the Lord never will. It reminds me that today in the church, there's an appearance of godliness, but a denial of repentance. And there are many people who are looking at things on, on the TV, uh, on the internet, watching movies that are so ungodly that they shouldn't be looking at. It reminds me also that, that pornography is a huge problem today for both men and women. It's something that needs to be addressed and dealt with. And there are many Christians who have lost holiness and purity in their own lives. We need to take sin seriously. 
right? We need, to, we need to make sure that we're dealing with it appropriately and know that disobedience never ends up for anything good. Disobedience always ends up separation from God's will. And it never ends well, as we see next, the fourth point here in verse 15. It ends in death. Disobedience gives birth to death, not to life. It may take years for sin to mature, but when it does, the result will always be death. If we only believe God's word and we see this final tragedy, it would encourage us more and more to yield to the Lord and not yield to sin or temptation. Or to temptation. And uh, so we want to make sure we realize that, that there is a judgment, that there is a penalty, that there is a real separation, that there is a death that comes from temptation. And these four stages of temptation, I think, are really clearly seen in, in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. If you take a look at the sin of Adam and Eve, uh, recorded in the Bible, we see the serpent used desire to interest Eve. Right? Is there anything wrong with desire? Is there anything wrong with gaining knowledge? Is, is there anything wrong with eating food? It says in Genesis 3, 6 that Eve saw that the tree was good for food. Her desire was aroused. That's the first stage. And then we see came deception. The bait that Satan used with Eve was the deception of thinking that eating it would make her wise like God. If you partake of this, you'll be like God. And so she went forward in that. And the third stage was that Eve disobeyed God by taking the fruit of the tree and eating it. And Adam did the same. He was right there. And because of this disobedience, both Adam and Eve experienced immediate spiritual death. Separation from God. Again, some people read that and they think, well, they didn't fall over and die. No, but they had immediate spiritual death, which is even worse. Separated from God. And that's where God says, Adam, where are you? Again, it's not that God lost Adam and Eve, right? He's got them in the garden and they go, oh no, where did I put those people? No, he felt that there was a break in their relationship. The, the closeness they once had was no longer there. So they had this separation. And ultimately, they did die physically. And that sin has entered the world. And that's the reason we all die, is because of Adam's sin. That original disobedience carries on into this world. And so we see all four of those stages. We see, uh, you know, that in the very beginning, Satan operated with these four stages. And he does the same things today. He uses our desires, then he leads it to deception, to then have a heart of disobedience, and ultimately it brings death. And so that's why I think James is saying here, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. It reminds me the, of Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. When we participate with sin, it always, always takes. It will take you further than you want to go. It will cost you more than you ever thought it would cost you. And the consequences will be so much more than you ever thought they would. Sin always takes from us when we participate with it. But in just a moment, we're going to see that when we participate with God, He always gives. In fact, that's the rest of Romans 6.23, that the gift of God is everlasting life. And so God's desire is to give us life eternal, and He likes to give us good gifts. So we've taken a look at considering God's blessing. We've taken a look at considering God's judgment. And now we're going to take a look at considering God's goodness. Verses 17 and 18. James says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
Again, we want to consider God's goodness, the goodness and the majesty of our Lord. And there are four things uh, that we want to take a look at here. And again, if you're taking notes, the first is that only God gives us good gifts. The second is He gives constantly. The third is He doesn't change. And the fourth is that we are His loved children. We'll take a look at the first there, that God only gives us good gifts. You know, it, it says here that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Everything good that we have comes from God. If it's not good, it didn't come from Him. All the blessings that we have in this world, in this life, are from the Lord. And the gift of God is the ultimate gift of God is everlasting life, right? It's the abundant life. It's a life that's fruitful as we abide in Him, as we follow Him. It's produced by trusting in Him. And like Eve, we don't want to be deceived in thinking that God is holding back from us, right? That's what Satan was doing, saying, Eve, God's holding back from you. Sure, He loves you, but there's something over here, this other tree, that only if you knew what would happen if you partook of this, oh, God... God loves you, but He's holding back. And we don't want to have that same mindset and think, well, God loves me, but He's holding back blessings from me. God's holding something back from me. No, God isn't. God loves us, and God has His goodness towards us. In fact, God has given us so much, He's given us His one and only Son. Talk about a sacrifice. God demonstrates His love for us while we're yet sinners. Jesus died for us. Right? Because God loves us. I mean, that's a good gift. And when God gives a blessing, He does it in a loving and gracious manner. It's a gift. And, and I love when you talk to kids about gifts. They know that you don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't have to pay any, anyone back for it. You simply receive it. You enjoy it. You, you become thankful for it. It's a free gift. And that's what God has given us. We don't earn it. We don't deserve salvation. We can't pay Him back for it. We simply receive it and are thankful for it. So what God gives to us and how He gives gifts to us are both good. So the first thing we see here is that God gives only good gifts. The second thing we see here is He gives constantly. The words comes down here is a continuation. Or literally... Every good gift and every perfect gift uh, from above keeps on coming down. It's a reminder to me that God does not give occasionally when He maybe feels like it. No, God gives constantly. It's like a river that just keeps going and never dries up. God constantly gives us good gifts. He constantly blesses us. Even when we don't see His gifts, He's sending them. And we took a look at this as we studied the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We have a heavenly bank account that is beyond belief. I mean, it's a retirement out of this world. We have all the blessings of the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where our richness is, is in Christ Jesus. And He gives us constantly. The third thing we see here is that God does not change. He, t- he mentions that these gifts, this love, these good gifts come from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. There's no shadows with the Father of lights. and It's impossible for God to change. He cannot change for the worse because He is holy. And he cannot change for the better because he's already perfect. So God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But he uses this imagery of the light of the sun. We see that varies on the earth, right? As the sun changes, there are shadows depending on where the sun goes. But the sun's shining somewhere on the earth all of the time. It's a reminder to us that if shadows come between us and the Father, he didn't cause them. He's the unchanging God. So if there's ever a time where we feel like we're distant from God, it's not that God took a step away from us. It's that we took a step away from Him. And and all we have to do is take that step forward and come right back to Him. God doesn't change. 
And this means that His love and goodness are always there for us. His forgiveness is always available. When we go through difficulties or even temptations, we can come to Him. He is the one from whom blessings and gifts come from. And He's the one who gives us those blessings and those good things. The fourth thing we see here, and we see this really clearly, is in verse 18. It says, Of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth, that is, we might be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. So we've seen that God gives good gifts. He gives constantly. He doesn't change. And the fourth thing we see here is that he, he allows us to become His children. We are His loved children. In my mind, this reminds me of John chapter 3, where Jesus went to speak with Nicodemus, who was the religious leader. Sometimes we refer to him as Nick at night, because he came to Jesus at night time. And Nicodemus thought that he was okay. He thought that he was righteous and was going to make it to heaven. He was going to enter in God's kingdom. And Jesus had a, had a, a wake-up call for him and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus got confused and said, What do you mean I've got to enter my mom's womb a second time? How is that humanly possible? That makes no sense. And Jesus told him, Well, that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. You need to be born from above. And that's what God is saying here. You know, Nicodemus thought that he was a child of God, but he was wrong. He needed a spiritual birth. And that spiritual birth is not of the flesh. It's of the Spirit. It's God's Spirit coming and dwelling in our hearts. and saving us. And, and it's the miracle that the Lord does. It's not our miracle. It's His miracle. And there are many people in our world today, unfortunately, who call themselves a Christian, but they're not born again. Right? Just because you say that you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're truly saved by Christ and for Christ. Right? Just because you go to a place and you say, I am of this nationality now. Now, if I went to Africa and said, I'm an African, people are going to know pretty quick, I'm not from there. <laughs> right? And if we go to heaven and we say, well, Lord, you know me. He's going to say, we, we never had that relationship. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not my child. You know, just as your car is in your garage, if you stand in your garage, it doesn't make you a car. Just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. We have to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's a work of the God. We put our faith in Jesus Christ who performed the miracle. And then it says we become this kind of first fruits or as prized possession, if you will. First fruits is a, is a picture from the Old Testament. That they would offer unto the Lord. When the Lord had blessed them, they would give up their first fruits in response of thankfulness to the Lord. And so we have become God's first fruits. We have become His prized possession. We are His loved children. And God loves us. And it, it reminds me that it says here that in verse 18, He brought us forth by the word of truth of His own will. It reminds me that just as a, a natural birth requires two parents, a spiritual birth requires two parents. The Word of God and the Spirit of God working on the hearts of the people of God. Right? We need to have that spiritual birth of the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling in us. But we need the truth, we need the gospel message that gives us that gospel, gives us that truth, gives us that change that needs to take place. And so it's the Word of God working on the hearts of the people of God. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to bring about the miracle of new birth. Right? We know the Word of God is living and powerful. And it's the Holy Spirit that generates the life in the heart of the sinner who trusts in Him. So we want to make sure that we have that personal relationship with the Lord. You know, there, Again, there are many people who say that they profess to be a Christian. Um, but the reality is, they don't really know Jesus Christ. And that's so important. That's the most important thing we can ever know for certain in this life, is that we personally know Jesus Christ. Again, we can fool a lot of people, but we can't fool the Lord. <laughs> but that's, that's what's most important. 
And if you're truly born again, everything changes. Your whole outlook on life changes. It's like all the, the missing pieces of the puzzle come together. You can finally see everything clearly. You know why you're here. You know where you came from. You know where you're going. You've got a roadmap for life. You've got a purpose. You've got a meaning. You've got value. And so you need to make sure you know the Lord. So God gives good gifts. He gives constantly. He doesn't change. And He desires us to be His children. So I want to close with verse 12 that we started with. He says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You so much for Your love for us. Thank You, Lord, that You've given us these warnings, these things to consider, that we're to consider Your blessings the ways that you lavish your love upon us, that you will give us the crown of life as we endure, as we keep going, as we continue to follow you, as we persevere, as we not grow weary while doing good. In due season, we will reap if we do not lose heart. Lord, may we continue to consider your judgment. May we continue to be reminded that Temptation will use desire in an ungodly way that will bring deception, disobedience, and ultimately death. We know in you, Jesus, we have victory, that we can overcome. That greater is He, the Holy Spirit living in us, than He who is in the world. The devil has no foothold on us if we're consumed and pursuing you. May you be that overriding passion for anything else in this life. And Lord, may we consider your goodness. That you give us only good gifts. That you are a good, good Father. That you give us constantly, not just occasionally, but you constantly love on us. You constantly bless us. There are so many ways we can counter blessings. Each and every day, for example, is a gift from you. That Lord, you don't change. You remain the same. Your love never fails us. And Lord, that we are your beloved children. We are loved by you. We are prized by you. We are the joy that was before the cross. That you endured the shame and sat down at the right hand of the Father. That Jesus, you value us. You are so in love with us. It's a crazy love that you have for us. Help us, Lord, to remember these things. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to mature us and grow us to become the people you desire us to be. That we'd be changed and transformed to become more and more like Jesus. That we would not be conformed to this world, but that we'd be transformed by the renewing of our mind through your word. That we'd become more like you, Jesus, to those around us. And Lord, if there be any here this morning who have yet to make that decision, yet to surrender their life to you, yet to become born again, that by your word of truth and by your Holy Spirit, you'd be convicting them of their sin, their need to surrender their life to you, but that, Lord, you'd also convince them of your amazing love, mercy, forgiveness, and grace for them, that you want to lavish your love on them, that you want to adopt them as your own, that you've been waiting for them to come to you to become your child. And Lord, if there's any here this morning who need to make that decision, would you work on their hearts right now? If that's you and say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to be born again. I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I simply want to encourage you to pray a prayer to Jesus, to ask Him to forgive you of your sins. That you believe he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the grave. And that you want to turn your life over to him. If that's you this morning, I want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and meet it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. 
that He shed His blood there for me. I believe that He was buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that You'd forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me from all the mistakes I've ever made. Cleanse me. Make me whiter than snow. Wash me clean, Lord. God, would you come into my heart, come into my life, be my Savior and my Lord. I surrender it to you. From this day forward, I choose to live for you and with you. I choose to follow you. God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for being my Lord and my friend. And I pray that you'd help me to follow you from this day forward. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name.